You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Lisa Marciano is a writer and Jungian analyst in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who has been in practice for over 20 years. Since 2016, she's had a special interest in gender, and she's worked clinically with gender dysphoric young people, parents of trans-identified youth, and with detransitioners. Her peer-reviewed papers on gender have appeared in Psychological Perspectives and the Journal of Analytical Psychology. Her writings have also appeared in Quillette and Aereo. She contributed chapters to the books Transgender Children and Young People, Born in Your Own Body, and Inventing Transgender Children and Young People. She's presented on the topic of gender dysphoria in the U.S. and internationally. Lisa co-hosts the popular weekly depth psychology podcast called This Young in Life, and her book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, won the 2021 Best Book Award sponsored by the American Book Fest in the parenting and family category. In our conversation today, Lisa joins us to talk about the very difficult task of finding appropriate therapy for a loved one or teen who's questioning their gender. We talk about what it's like working with clients who may be under the influence of a belief system or ideology. And Lisa highlights the parental expectations of what parents think therapy should look like, and we contrast that against the complex and subtle relational dynamics that occur between a therapist and their client. We look at some of the common traps that therapists fall into when working with gender, like being too affirming too soon, or challenging a client before sufficient rapport and exploration have taken place. We also make an exciting announcement about GETA, our new Gender Exploratory Therapy Association. Here's our conversation with Lisa. Hi, good afternoon, Stella, and our very special guest, Lisa Marciano. Hey. It's Good a drill to see you roll. both. <laughs> it's a drum roll. We've got our pal Lisa, our pal and our eminent colleague Lisa. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. <laughs> so we we wanted to have Lisa on today because um, we wanted to address kind of a big picture question about you know when when a parent's child starts questioning their gender. How should they think about therapy? You know, should they rush their child in to see a therapist? What what does good therapy look like for an adolescent questioning their gender? And of course, there's there's a whole host of other important topics related to this. So we're so glad to have you on to talk about this, Lisa. Mm. Well, I'm I'm glad to be here talking with you about it. I think I think more than anything for us to have this um, this kind of discussion today for me is that it feels often that there's a lot of misinformation around what is good therapy. And there's a lot of, I often liken it to the Wizard of Oz behind this green curtain and parents especially think there's there's all sorts of magic going on behind the green curtain. I'm not quite sure. And then they might t- contact us slightly horrified about what was going on behind the mm-hmm. green curtain. Right. And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't want to diss my profession, but that doesn't sound like great therapy. And it puts us all in a very tricky position. Um, and it's not something that I'm I'm keen to do. However, I really believe in psychotherapy. I really believe in a psychological approach. And I I hope that we give it a good kind of outing today. Well, you know, Stella, you're you're bringing up something so interesting because I, I feel like in so many ways, as I'm sure you've covered before on the podcast, we're in this really interesting space and at this really interesting moment. And something that I know we've talked about a lot is the the sort of exceptionalism of gender. So I've talked to so many parents who have given me some version of the following story. My child came to me and declared that she was trans. This was a surprise to us, but of course we wanted to take it seriously and support her. I wanted her to get the help she needed. So we went to a therapist 
And I assumed the therapist would do a thorough job of exploring, of assessing, of helping her think about her choices. And instead, I was shocked and horrified when uh, at the second session, we were told that she needs hormones. And I think that uh, many parents who may have perhaps been in therapy with them before or have a certain expectation about what therapy is and how therapy works, assume that taking a child to a therapist, a gender therapist, or even a gender clinic, if they're, if they're completely new to this area, they have a very understandable expectation that there's going to be a real professional engagement around their child's issue rather than a kind of uh, quick green lighting toward medical transition. And so many people are just so uh, dismayed and in fact, indeed horrified to learn that that's not the case. I mean, this is the problem with the affirmative approach. And I think you're lifting up something that's a problem even outside of the specific realm of gender, though, of course, with gender, I think this problem is exacerbated and almost concentrated. But I'm thinking of a conversation that you guys had on this young in life with Jonathan Shedler and some other interviews with him where he was talking about how our problem right now in the field is that it's all about what diagnosis you have. Mm. And so once somebody has the diagnosis, that really dictates almost a step-by-step manualized approach that the therapist takes. And like what you were saying earlier, parents think, oh, my kid's struggling with gender. Makes sense. Let me take them to a gender clinic. And to the lay person, that sounds like a good fit. But what actually happens is that the assumptions are baked in Mm -hmm. to that gender dysphoria diagnosis. And that dictates the way the therapist responds which is different from what I think good therapy should do, which is to really take a bird's eye view of all the moving parts in a client's life and to try to understand them as a whole person in context, in a family context, in a social context, in a personality style context, so many different layers. And instead, what we have is kind of once you have the diagnosis, then you have a very straightforward treatment recommendation. That's such a great point. And what you're lifting up is the problems with the medical model. So some number of years ago, especially when the field of psychotherapy started to get insurance reimbursement and we were in the world of managed care, we really bought into the medical model, which, you know, has some validity in the field of mental health, But if it's carried too far, it really isn't appropriate. So the medical model, if you have a sore throat and you think you might have strep throat, you go to the doctor, you tell the doctor, I think I have strep throat. The doctor does a test, which can show definitively whether or not your sore throat is caused by that particular pathogen. And if it is, you are given a medication that attacks that pathogen and you get better. But that is not the way that depression happens, for example. There isn't a biomarker for depression. It's not like you get sad and teary, and then you can go somewhere and someone can say, let me run this test, and I will definitively know if you have this thing called depression. I mean, actually, depression is really just like sort of a very uh, complicated uh, construct, if you will. I mean, we could spend a whole hour talking about sort of what that is. Um, but so it can't it can't be sort of um, uh, just uh, surgically removed, and it, it can't necessarily be treated with this idea of uh, kind of a magic bullet. Now that's not to say that there's not a place for medication. That's that's not what I'm intending to say here. Or assessment, right? Or or assessment or diagnosis. I mean, all of these things can be really really helpful. But when we think about it only in terms of the medical model, what happens is we're really concretizing it. And then we lose the psychological approach that sees things like you were talking about, Sasha, within this broader context that includes uh, the social context, the um, environmental context, the biological context, the family systems context. Yeah and the symbolic context as well. 
I, I do think that when you go to the specialist, so if you've got an eating disorder and you go to the eating disorder clinic or if you go to the depression clinic, you've already narrowed it in, in quite a significant way. And usually you're really quite deep in the trenches. If I see somebody and they have an eating disorder, I could see them for a very long time before we'd start talking about eating disorder clinics. And so it, it seems to go from zero to 100 with gender that it goes straight to the gender clinic, not because of the of the heaviness of the of the distress, more because of the exoticness of people aren't used to it and therapists aren't used to it. Parents aren't used to it. So we immediately start talking about a gender clinic where we wouldn't be doing that. We wouldn't be going to the throat clinic. We'd be going to the GP or I don't know what you call the, the mm-hmm. general doctor. The mm-hmm. same with, with eating disorder, depression, all those different things. You'd be going to the generalized, qualified, competent, experienced therapist. And Mm -hmm. narrowing it to one is really kind of, uh, it's kind of encapsulating it in a way that probably isn't the most helpful way. Unless it's totally decontextualized. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, do do people go in, uh, you know, when they go to the eating disorder clinic, in my world, it's only when they're really lost, deep, deep, deep within eating disorder land, would they go to the clinic? Is that the same in America or does it narrow sooner? Um, I mean, I think certainly people with eating disorders enter treatment with general practitioners. But if, if you've got if you've got a really full-blown case of anorexia, I mean, it's so dangerous. You know, anorexia yeah. is one of the highest mortality rates that certainly it's appropriate to be talking quickly about some kind of stepped up treatment. So just, you know, once weekly psychotherapy, if you, if you've, if you've got a a serious case of anorexia, like like a life threatening kind of anorexia, right. right. You know, I certainly would be trying to get that person into a higher level of care pretty quickly, but, but, you know, people come in all the time with disordered eating. Maybe Mm -hmm. they're, maybe they're binge eating, maybe they're, they're bulimic and, uh, you know, and certainly I've worked with people in those situations and explore the disordered eating or the even the eating disorder, um, you know, in, in the fuller context of the person's psyche. Mm. I'd, I'd like to kind of contrast eating disorders with gender dysphoria a little bit, because I remember even in my training, I was aware that there are different ways to think about eating disorders. You know, there's the sense of control that a person gains from managing um, their intake and their weight. And then there's also the kind of loss of control that occurs in bulimia. And there's the self-esteem issues that are wrapped up in it. And even though, you know, I'm aware that when it comes to eating disorder treatments, there are a lot of different perspectives, actually. Like, should you force patients to count calories? Should you actually take more of a self-compassion approach? Like, there are lots of different ways to look at it. Um, But I think the underlying theme there is that the patient and clinician together have to agree that there's something unhealthy about this pattern. Yes, in order to move forward, regardless of the approach. And I think what's different, at least at this moment in time about gender is that because gender identity represents a person's felt sense of identity, according to the kind of innate gender identity model, therapists are currently being trained not to think about gender dysphoria as a kind of disordered pattern or dysregulation or unhealthy coping strategy. Gender dysphoria is treated as though it's just almost um, just an afterthought to the fact that this person is transgender. That's and right. when someone is transgender, that kind of creates a cascade of behaviors and steps and um, approaches that the therapist is going to use in treatment, which is different from something like an eating disorder. And that's part of what makes it so hard for families to find appropriate care because we are being taught that gender dysphoria is not actually something that you want to resolve unless it's through affirming. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting, right? Because gender dysphoria is at the current time in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of, uh, of you know, mental disorders. And, and so anything that's in there, right, you is presumably something you would go to a therapist for uh, and try to resolve. So, you know, if someone comes in with anxiety, my my wish 
is that after we work together for some time, that parents, that person will experience less anxiety. And, and so if someone comes in with gender dysphoria, my wish for that person would be that they would experience less gender dysphoria. And if I could do that by helping them think about it and relate to the distress in a different way, which is essentially what I do for everything else, uh, then, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean, okay, we're going to help you transition. So it really is treated very, very differently. And I think it is important, as you were saying, Sasha, that parents realize this. I mean, therapists are being trained to affirm. And there are trainings going on all the time about here's how you write the letter. And it really is through this lens of, I want to say sort of like a human rights lens that this person needs access to these treatments and you're the one who can make sure that they get them. And, uh, you know, uh, the other thing that happens, which I know Stella, you've talked about a lot, but I think you're absolutely right, is sometimes uh, someone with a gender dysphoria or a gender dysphoric teen shows up at a therapist's, you know, door and says, can you, can you see my kid? And the therapist says, I don't know anything about that. You should go to the gender clinic. So it winds up that there's a whole bunch of, that, that what parents have to choose from is either people who feel like they know what to do and what they think they need to do is to affirm and uh, facilitate medical transition or therapists who think, well, this is, an, this is a new thing that I haven't been trained in that I don't know much about, so I'm not going to work with this person. And who loses out is is the child who's going to therapy and the parents who presume that the best thing to do was to get the professionals in. And in mm-hmm. a way, I feel they, the parents um, are often so um, intimidated by the newness and strangeness of this concept, gender dysphoria, that they feel at sea and say, I, I can't understand this. Let me get professionals and I think there is a rush to kind of um, professionalize or pathologize childhood and pathologize our problems and also get the professionals in for all of our our parenting issues. I, I do it myself. I, I get it. And there is a feeling of I, I love you very much. I feel out of my depth. I'm very competent in my work life. I'm not competent with your complicated, messy, emotional issues here. I'm going to get the best there is because that's how I show my love to you. now. Where's the best there is? Off I go to Google. And that's <laughs> where it all goes, really. To me, this is where it all goes wrong. And that's why I think you, us three know each other, because we're like, people are being sent really off into, as everybody says, a rabbit hole. They mm-hmm. go into a rabbit hole and it takes them some time to come back out. Mm-hmm. I think that's such a good point. And, and um, I'd like to... Um, remind listeners, we actually made a video about this a while ago. And I'd like to expand on something that you said at the time, Lisa, you were talking about how parents who have gone down the rabbit hole that Stella describes, Mm -hmm. they might start to become a little bit wise about how important it is to vet the therapist, right? So it's almost like the the steps are your kid announces trans, you, you freak out, you realize something else is going on. You do the natural thing, which is, oh, let me find a gender therapist. You go to the gender therapist. You realize they're on a one-track pathway to medicalization. You go, oh, crap. You go back to Google. Then you find people like us. And then they they think, okay, now I'm really going to vet the therapist. And what I've seen happen, which is really sad, is that they do a ton of research. They interview like a dozen therapists. They find one who says, of course, I'll go slow. Of course, I'll explore. And then Lisa, spoiler alert, what happens? Because you (laughs) talked about this in our last video. Yeah. Well, I think that unless you are a therapist who has become aware of this cultural phenomenon and are awake to the role of social influence, you are going to get that kid in your office and you're going to say, of course, I'm going to use all of my good psychotherapeutic training. Of course, I'm going to listen very carefully. Of course, I'm not going to green light this kid for medical transition. But, you know, our job as therapists is to um, sort of be on the side of the person we're seeing. 
So our predisposition always is to align with our client, to use our empathic imagination, to feel our way into what might be going on with that person. Uh, you know, I, I want to say that, especially in the beginning of stages of therapy with someone, you know, there there is a way that I'm I'm going to pretty much affirm most of what they tell me. I, I'm not going to kind of question them or confront them because I'm I'm getting to know them. I'm I'm getting to know their inner psychic landscape. And and so if they tell me that their spouse is the worst person on the planet, I'm there's a little part of my brain that's going to keep some space open for the fact that that might not be true. But at first I'm just going to listen and say, "Yeah, tell me more. Tell me more about your terrible spouse." Mm. Um because that's part of how we create a, a connection with our client is we we you know, in social work, we always talk about starting where the client's at. Yeah. And and that's important. So if you're a therapist and you've got one of these kids in your office and you're not aware of social influence and you're not aware of what's on the internet, and that kid is telling you, I've always felt this way. I feel horrible. I can't get out of bed in the morning. I I would rather die than be a girl. I you know I shower with the lights off. I shower I mean, with the I, lights I've off. I've heard that about a thousand times. Yeah, yeah, I have to. Uh you're gonna think, oh, It's really one of those. I have a true unicorn and I, and I'd better get, get this kid what he needs. You know, I'm thinking about during the eighties and the nineties when there was a a big jump in the number of people getting diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. You know, we were all told that it was quite rare but it was also pretty kind of sexy. You know, there'd been some movies made about it. And that's what created the big jump in the numbers of people getting that diagnosis. So if you're a therapist, you know, it's unlikely that you're going to have someone come into your office who really has multiple personality disorder. But there might be a little part of you that would be really excited to get one of those clients because it's pretty interesting. And it's in the news a lot and it's on the big screen. And, and, so, and if you just left a training about it. And yeah. if you just left a training you know? about it. <sighs> yeah. And you know when you go to a training and they've told you something that's really interesting and you think, I'd love to try that. And then you have an opportunity to try it. You can't help yourself if you're involved in your industry. You're like, oh, oh great. I could, I could explore this thing that I'm very, I find very interesting. But sorry, right. I cut in on right. you. Right. Yeah. So, so I think some of these therapists in the, in the eighties and nineties, you know, had someone come in who, who presented this way and there was a tendency for the therapist and the patient to kind of collude in, uh, reifying these symptoms that looked a certain way. Mm. And, and it might've been possible to understand the symptoms from a slightly different standpoint, which might've resulted in a different diagnosis and more exploration. And in fact, you know, the interesting thing is that people were coming in with these kinds of symptoms and sometimes they would get the diagnosis of multiple personality disorder and sometimes they wouldn't. And, you know, the people who got the diagnosis of MPD were more likely to commit suicide than the people who didn't. Oh, God. The people who didn't get that diagnosis tended to do better, even though they started off with the same symptoms. Wow. So there's something about the expectation that gets created. This is another way where the medical model doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to the doctor with a sore throat, you've either got whatever that bug is that gives you strep throat or you don't. (laughs) And the bug doesn't care how you think about it. And yet, you know, like if there was an equivalent, you'd have a tick list of I'm going to ask you 10 questions about your throat. And if you say yes to seven out of 10, you have it. Because that's how, <laughs> that's how they diagnose, let's say, gender dysphoria or depression and stuff. It's a tick list on how you answer is whether you get diagnosed or not. Mm-hmm. While mm-hmm. In, in, with strep throat, it's, it's much more uh, definitive because the medical model works for such medical issues. But it doesn't well, work. It's empirically verifiable. And another layer of this is that there is a nocebo effect which means if you believe something is going to give you unpleasant physical negative symptoms, it will. And so to your checklist idea, Stella, 
you might do the checklist and you might actually have a sore throat, but they test you and they realize you don't have strep actually, you don't have any kind of bug, and it turned out all to be in your head. There would be an explanation for that too. But like you said earlier, Lisa, with all kinds of psychological conditions, the line between the symptom, where it came from, how did it develop, how much of it is due to lifestyle factors, how much of it is due to your belief systems, how much of it is influence, how much of it is maybe you were doing really poorly overall in your life and then the symptom popped up. All of that's a lot blurrier. And so it's just, Mm -hmm. it's really interesting to think this through together because it, it tells us how for so many mental health, quote, conditions, you can't really separate it from the culture in which no. you live. And and it's so interesting. Kathleen Stock actually pointed this out, and I, I thought it was so interesting. You know, the DSM never mentions the social context. Hmm. But, but social context is so important in mental health. I mean, both in terms of the stuff we've just been talking about, but even like in terms of like depression, because depression is so linked to loneliness. Yeah. So it's so weird that we as a culture think about wow. mental health outside of the social context. It's just really bizarre when you think about it. And can I just say that this, yeah. is, sorry to jump in, but this, this emphasis on diagnosis, it's so attractive and alluring. Give me the diagnosis, give me the treatment path, the framework. Our brains just settle because we've got all sorts of kind of things to kind of organize our thoughts around. And it's, it's a false, it's a falseness. It pretends mm-hmm. to offer you a certainty and a framework and stuff. And actually, our minds are so much more nebulous and they're so hard to pin down. It's, a pl- it's pleasant to have this framework. And for some people, it can be so helpful when they have a diagnosis. But for a lot of people, it can be a, a, too much of an allure and not enough um, depth, really, into all the other things that are impacting them. Well, it's complex, isn't it? Because I, I've certainly seen it happen where someone got a diagnosis and you could just see the relief that they yeah. understood. I mean, for example, I used to work with um, uh, Vietnam vets. And, you know, you got a guy who's been having all these symptoms for so many years. He comes in and he talks about it. He thinks he's just nuts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's been having nightmares and intrusive thoughts. And you sit him down and you say, well... There's this thing called PTSD and soldiers have been getting it for thousands of years. And here's what we know about it. And you could just see the relief. It's like, oh, so what's happening to me is kind of normal. There's a frame for it. And then, yes, and there's a treatment. Yes, there's something we can do that will maybe help you feel better. So I, I don't want to say that there's not a role for it, but diagnoses are so uh, critical in framing how we understand our own suffering that we have to be really careful about what we do because we create reality by naming it. I want to bring in something else because I work primarily with young people, teenagers and young adults. And many of them, of course, are getting their information from other youth heavy sources like TikTok and various online, um, you know, websites and things. And something I've noticed when it comes to mental health diagnoses is that Teenagers seem to be telling each other that if you have symptoms and you don't have a formal diagnosis, then you're faking it or it's somehow your fault or you're doing it for attention. So I think there's like an added layer of um, being able to remove blame from oneself if they're having distressing symptoms and there's a legit label for it. Like I, you know, in working with young people who are really attached, like I have this condition, then I have this condition and I'm trying to kind of tease that apart. What I'm realizing is this is a way to say, it's not my fault Mm -hmm. that I feel crappy or that I'm having this really difficult time. And I think there's something we do have to honor about, like, what is the meaning of this label to this person? How can we hold that, but also still think broader? Let's still think bigger. Because one of the things that treating a DSM diagnosis looks like is symptom reduction. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily mean improved quality of life 
or growing your gifts or capitalizing on the things you're good at, right? Like symptom reduction is just like focusing on the negative and trying to make it less. Mm -hmm. But when people come to therapy, um, thinking again about Jonathan Shedler, they want to overall be living in a way that feels better and their lives are improved. And that's not just the same thing as reducing the dysphoria. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Though, of mm -hmm. course, I can imagine if someone's experiencing a lot of distress, reducing the distress might be step one in helping them to find those fulfilling aspects of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you brought up a couple of things there. I mean, first of all, there's there's this way that um, young people are very attached to to diagnoses. And and I think Sasha, what you said about the the diagnosis being a way of saying this is not my fault is is really important. You know, there's been a, a lot of efforts to destigmatize mental health issues, and I think on balance that's a really laudable goal. Uh, you know, for I mean, PTSD is a is a good example because you know, as as some people may remember, the Vietnam vets came back, and they were they were very often reviled and. Uh, you know, the, the culture was very angry at them, at all the uh, kind of anger that roiled around about the Vietnam War was initially mm. kind of uh, uh, projected onto vets. They, they would come home in the airport, they would be spat at and that kind of thing. And then, and then they would have these symptoms and they were... Uh, they were not understood. They were, there was that real homelessness problem. And when it got rewritten as, you know, these, these men are, are suffering because of something that they went through and the subsequent mental health issues, it became a lot easier for them to seek treatment. Uh, people were more understanding. And, and there's no question that it was helpful. So I think that's a really important point. And then the third thing that you kind of moved into is this great point that, as you said, Jonathan Chedler makes, it's that people don't just want symptom reduction. They want a fuller, they want to live the fullest version of themselves. And that's where I think something like gender dysphoria is really interesting because any symptom, any distress that we experience, I always think that when a new person lands in my office, it's like uh, it's like the world's most exciting mystery novel. <laughs> it's uh, maybe I shouldn't say exciting, but but it but I I feel a sense of. Uh, I want to join with this person in understanding the mystery of their distress. And it is a mystery. We don't know. We don't know what it is. You yeah. know, if you're feeling depressed, okay, that's a word. What the heck does it even mean, first of all? But then what's really, you know, what does it feel like? When did it start? What is it linked to? What does it mean in your life? Yeah. That's what we're going to, that's what we're going to do. That's the trail we're going to follow. And anything can be a door into the soul. Depression, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, gender dysphoria, they're all doors into the deep interior. And I think um, parents who've, who've had, a, let's say, a difficult experience with their children going to therapy, and then they go to somebody who's, who's speaking in the way we're speaking now, the parents, I think, can feel very lost because they're thinking, where's the symptom reduction? Where's the improvement? What, what's going on here? I have no idea. They seem to be talking about fairly abstract subjects. And I could see how I could be a, ther a parent if I didn't know therapy. And I could feel a little bit frantic and think, this is going askew. This is going off into other lands when it should be talking about gender. And it's like, that's not really how it works. And there's not enough, to me, there's not enough information about how it works is how we're talking which is really quite wide open. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for this show, and we're grateful to Rhyme and Genspect for supporting us. Rhyme, or Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving long term care for gender variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And Genspect is an international alliance of parents and professional groups whose aim is to advocate for parents of gender-questioning children and young people. 
If you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts and special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. Now back to the show. And, you know, we did that series um, earlier this year Um, about, like, behind the curtain, right? And we talked a little bit about that. But specifically with adolescents, you know, Lisa, you started us off talking about the expectations of therapy. And one thing that parents have to understand is that Therapy does not turn your 15-year-old into a 25-year-old, right? <laughs> oh, God. That would be so great if it did. <laughs> Come we are, we are, <laughs> we're, we're in a bit of a waiting game. I mean, there's so much happening to the adolescent psychologically, biologically, socially, in terms of their attempt to separate from family and parents. So there's a lot going on. And so one expectation parents should have is that therapy, good therapy takes a lot of time. And most of the time, the changes are incremental. And you might see a slight opening up. You know, you might notice your kids a little more self-reflective than they were six months ago. But it's not often a major transformation in the matter of a few weeks or even a few years. I mean, I I think that therapy takes time. Um, And, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, what happens when a therapist is using their empathic skills and joining with the, the client. And I often tell parents the therapist's job is to hold in the back of their mind, just like what you said about your patient, Lisa, a hypothesis about what might be going on, that there might be more sides of this story here, but to kind of join them where they are in that process of moving. Um, And sometimes it's hard to know as the parent whether or not that's actually happening in therapy. And sometimes the opposite thing happens, which is therapists who may be are aware of the social contagion happening with gender could go in too strong. And I've heard from parents that said, we worked so hard to find this awesome therapist. And after two sessions, my kid refused to see them. And so there's another complicated layer here, which is we are working with indoctrinated clients and how you do that is incredibly sensitive and It's honestly not something that is taught in most training programs. So this has been something I've really, um, I think for me, it's a little bit intuitive because I tend to have a very gentle approach to therapy anyway. I'm not really confrontational in therapy. So that already worked in my favor, but I've had to really learn a lot about what it's like to be under the influence of a group or a belief system or even a partner. Like this is not completely unique to gender, but not a lot of therapists understand that these things are related. Uh, Such, such a good point. I have a very experienced, brilliant colleague who doesn't know much about gender dysphoria. And she said to me at one point, wouldn't you treat it just like you would treat anything else? And the answer is, well, yes, of course, but... Because it's not just like anything else, because these kids are coming in with some very fixed beliefs that they've gotten from the internet. I remember one detransitioner pointing out that if you join a cult, the cult will often mandate that you spend a certain number of hours per day uh, consuming cult materials, you know, watching movies or uh, um, you know, doing readings. And, and she, she noted that she was spending, you know, twice that amount of time per day watching YouTube transition videos. And so and I don't think even really sophisticated psychodynamic therapists may not be aware that that's happening that- and that these kids are coming in with really rigid ideas that have been fed to them by social media. That is going back to, I, I couldn't agree more. That's going back to when you said the therapist who thinks, well, actually, I think I have a unicorn here. I have. And I think again and again, when I've worked with um, therapists who discuss it, and I I would ask, well, what was their social media influence with with this person? And then I find they haven't explored that. And it's like, yes, OK, you, you've half the picture. You've, you've maybe 40, 30 percent of the picture here. You, you've well, a whole and- chunk missing here. Exactly. And and also the friend group. 
yeah. because that oh, can sorry, be an yeah, important yeah. part of it. And and I think especially for the boys to find out what their porn use has been like, yeah. which is a hard thing to talk about with an adolescent boy, or it's a really hard thing to get him to talk about. But but sometimes the the porn diet that some of these boys have been consuming can be part of what's gone on with the development of a transgender identity. Um, I mean, it can be so complicated. But there's there's so much to explore. I don't. I think we are we are just at the beginning of being able to uh, of formulating how. Uh, how social media influence works, especially in adolescence. And I know there's been some really interesting research that's come out recently about Tourette's and the number of mostly adolescent girls with a sudden onset of Tourette's symptoms, very atypical with, uh, you know, and, and these are, these are serious, sometimes debilitating symptoms, but they can be traced directly back to social media and there's a really interesting paper about that. So the, we're in a new mental health landscape now. Yeah. And we're only just beginning to understand that. And not not only that, I mean, there are kids who are basically developing symptoms from binging on materials about the symptoms. But the other layers here are so complicated. Like we know that one of the important tasks of adolescence is to find your sense of identity and your group of kids. Social relationships are of tremendous importance. So what happens when your primary mode of contact is text messaging? This impersonal screen with just typed words on it. And this is your main mode of who your friends are. And when someone says, oh, I have a girlfriend and you find out it's literally someone on the other side of the country they've never met and they've never smelled each other or been close. Like like there's, there's so many layers of complexity that we are barely, barely starting to become curious about. Mm -hmm. And something I felt really conflicted about is how much time I'm online. And I've mm. really tried to ask myself, could I do this work if I tried to reduce my online time? And of course, there's like the part of me that reads like Cal Newport and these other like really productive people that say, of course, you don't need social media. But what I also recognize is this gender dysphoria in teenage kids and girls phenomenon is inextricably linked to the social media and the internet. And so I think another kind of um, important thing that a therapist would have to understand is how this works and how these online relationships work. How does Instagram work? How does TikTok work? How are children using these devices and how do they influence their relationship to one another to their parents, to themselves, and just a whole host of other things. So, so Sasha, are you saying that when I spend too much time on Twitter (laughs) that I can call it research? Yes, definitely. (laughs) You can put it down for continuous professional development, I think. (laughs) I need if I could get a CEU for every like five hours that I was online, I would never have to take another class again. <laughs> I, I do think you know what we're talking about. We need to know, and I th- think us three happen to know because of our lifestyles about what they're talking about with TikTok and YouTube and stuff like that. I do find that when I work with families, that um, I I urge the parents to get to know, get to know what your kid is watching online, get to know. The TikTok, the Snapchat, the whole, that whole world. And very often the parents don't want to. They find it boring and distasteful and they just, they're like shudder at the whole thing. And I think it's, it's too important. And I think it's part of that shipping out, uh, the problems to the professionals. You, you deal mm-hmm. with that whole tech content. I can't deal with it. It's awful. He's online all the time. And it's like, mm-hmm. we kind of can't, a poison chalice arrived when the professionals arrived into parenting. Because suddenly parents could start saying to professionals, deal with that problem, will you? Yep. Yeah. Just yep. deal with that one. You know, Stella, I really, I really want to talk about that. I really want to come back to it, but I I wanna I wanna hit I wanna hit Sasha up a little okay. bit more yeah. on indoctrination. Oh my god, I'm the guest and I'm like telling you guys what to do. How did I that think happen? You've Someone earned this position me. because we spent a week together in New Orleans, so you can tell us what to do now. <laughs> yeah, we got offline and spent time we together. We sure in person. did. Which was a revelation, may I say, but carry on. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> in so many ways. Um, 
so so Sasha, I one of the things I really admire about you is that you really have created a way of working with these indoctrinated kids. That that is that is psychodynamic, but also uh, it d- does try to address these false beliefs, these kind of fixed false beliefs, because. A lot of um, my colleagues who who work in this way, who work kind of psychodynamically with these kids, will will sort of just avoid talking about gender, which I think is a great place to start because it's sort of like with with psychodynamic psychotherapy, we always assume like the the it's not about it's never about what it's about. Like someone mm-hmm. comes in and they're like, uh, "I hate my job," and it's like, "Okay, I want to hear about your job," but part of you is going, "Yeah, there's there this is about there's some deeper story here." So a kid comes in and says, I, I think I'm trans and the psychodynamic or psychoanalytic psychotherapist says, yeah, I know there's a deeper story. So let's talk about everything else to get to the deeper story. And and that is effective to a point. Yeah. But I, but I think, but then you've got a kid who's going home and watching five hours of YouTube transition videos. Right. And, and there, there has to be a way of, it's a very delicate thing of sort of challenging that, you know, kind of, in concert with the, with the, with the kid, like what, what not, you know, this is not conversion therapy. This is like, not, you shouldn't be thinking that, but this is like, let's think about it together. Let's think about it together. And the the closest thing that I can think about when I think about kind of working with someone who is on, who is influenced is as many years ago, I used to work with uh, victims of domestic violence and a domestic violence relationship is an influence relationship. So cult experts like um, Steve Hassan consider, and I think this is exactly right. You can have, you can be under undue influence in a, in a one-on-one relationship. You can be under undue influence in a group like a cult. And even at the national level, like, you know, uh, Nazism or something like that, mm-hmm. that these are all instances of influence. And we're, all susceptible to influence, but but just to take it back to domestic violence, as anyone who knows anything about domestic violence victims, they often present like this. They, this is this is a case I worked with. This woman would come see me every week, and she would tell me about these horrible, horrible things that her husband did to her. And if I said to her, "Oh my God, that's terrible," she would get incredibly protective of him. I didn't say that because I had really good supervision. I wanted to say, you know, oh my God, what, you know, what are you doing? Mm. But she would have left and she would have never come back. And uh, if I had, if I had said, well, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I had kind of reacted too strongly in that direction. She would get really protective of her husband. And so what I had to do was things like, I, I remember this and, and I use this to this day when someone's in a situation analogous to this, I would say, tell me what you love about him. Yeah. And that just make that just makes people just their defenses drop. You can see the gratitude in their eyes that you asked that question. Yeah. And I'm not going to say it's, it's such a fine line to walk because I don't want to give the sense that I condone what the husband is doing, but I also don't want to challenge her uh, belief in her version of this relationship too quickly or with too much force. And by the way, if you went into a domestic violence victim, you said, this guy is beating you up. What the heck are you doing? You need to leave. It would not work. Yeah. And what I'd like to say to that is, first of all, that sounds exactly like how I work with gender dysphoric kids. And I would suspect the woman in your office was there because she probably felt conflicted. And of maybe course. once you established a rapport, you might say something like, we've talked about all the reasons you love your husband, but I bet there's another part of you that feels really unsure of what to do about the fact that he hurts you sometimes, you know? And so when, when it comes to the gender dysphoric kids, I will absolutely, again, with, with, with a hypothesis in mind, right? You don't lose yourself to the client's narrative. But you would start by trying to understand, wow, it seems like being trans is really important to you. What has changed in your life since you came out? What Mm -hmm. have you fixed in your life? Or what was Mm -hmm. going wrong that you were able to improve? There's always a need being met. 
And it may not be that straightforward because a lot of kids say, I really wish I wasn't trans, but I am. But even if they're not saying it out loud, there's something they're meeting with this identity. And your job is to compassionately and curiously and in somewhat of a neutral way, try and figure out what that is. And all clients feel ambivalent about things in their life that don't fully make sense or that aren't really serving the need. Like the trans identity is a way to, in kind of a distorted way, can meet a need, but it doesn't really get fully met. And when your needs Mm -hmm. aren't fully met, you have an instinct about that, that something about this isn't right. And the long-term goal is to help the client bring those kind of hidden doubts to the surface so they can work it out. Well, what you're talking about is this important word that you used. You're talking about ambivalence. And we have to normalize ambivalence. I tell patients all the time, most of us are ambivalent about everything most of the time. I mean, (laughs) uh, you know, (laughs) I I, I say, you know, ask me if I want like Mexican or Indian tonight. I'll pick one, but I'll feel ambivalent. You know, and, and so much more so for big decisions in our lives. Of course, we're ambivalent. The thing that is true about many of these trans kids, about, about many people who are indoctrinated, is they split off their ambivalence. And so they, they you know, no, I'm 100% sure, you know, and that's why the physicians that are like, oh, but they're, you know, he's really sure he wants to transition. It's like, well, but that's, that's actually a problem. That's a red right. Where's the ambivalence? <laughs> because ambivalence is normal. I mean, you know, ask me how I felt the week before my wedding. You know, it's like, it's normal. It's normal to feel ambivalent. You know, th- there's not. So, so, uh, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I did some supervision at one point with this really brilliant relational analyst and she had this great formula that I use all the time. It's so easy. It's so simple. A part of you feels really good about your decision to transition. And another part of you has some concerns. All you're doing is giving them back their ambivalence. It's very gentle. You just do it. And you yeah. say that some version of that again and again. And you just give them permission to feel both ways because most of us feel both ways about everything. Yeah. It's frightening for the client who has convinced themselves that they're certain and the certainty means they're trans. That's right. It's frightening for them to hear about ambivalence. Yeah, I think what's usually happening in those cases is the parents are holding all the ambivalence. That's right. And the child is holding all the certainty. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and Sue and Marcus Evans talk about that in their yeah. book. That, that what you do w- when you're in this state is you split off the ambivalence, you have someone else hold it, and then you get to get rid of that person. Like you get to say, oh, my parent is a, is a transphobic bigot. And then you don't have to deal with your ambivalence because you've sort of gotten it out of your system. But- M- many times since I've started working around gender issues, I've thought to myself, if I had my time again, I think I'd orient towards family systems therapy. Mm. I, I, I very often think we could have the whole family in here and we oh, could gosh. really do extraordinary work. And it feels it's all been it's all been channeled into gender and one child when there's another sibling who isn't even in the picture and should be here. And there's parents and there's all sorts of dynamics floating around. And yeah. it's all got centered on on gender and the one child. And it, it feels really um unbalanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and 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 Stella, this goes to the point that you're making because what happens when these kids announce that they're trans is suddenly they have all of the power. Often, by the way, they may have had too much power before. Sometimes I think that was going on. But certainly once they announce the trans identity, they've got all the power. And then and then and then there's this thing where parents are really surrendering their authority to the therapist. Yeah. It's like parents understandably panic because this is terrifying. And you're gonna take the kid to the therapist, and the therapist, and th- this is where expectations come in, that the therapist is going to fix your kid for you. Your ther- the therapist is going to convince your kid that she's not actually trans. And and hopefully do it quickly, right? Like, w- what do you need? Six before months? 18. Before 18 right. years old. Before 18. Which, which it, it's a really, really, really complex field. I think we're in the beginning of it in many ways. And it's going to run 
I feel for many, many years. Mm-hmm. Hence our, our, our brave new organization. Would you like to talk a little bit about it, Lisa? <laughs> Yeah, well, the three of us have been uh, very involved in setting up with several really amazing colleagues, a new organization called the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association. And our website is genderexploratory.org. We are just in the beginning stages of launching, but we will be a community of therapists who practice according to an exploratory model. And uh, obviously, a very diverse group of therapists. There's, you know, not a, sort of uh, a, a, a textbook on how to do this. Not one size fits all. That's right. <laughs> um, and and one thing that I think parents will be happy about is that we will have a directory of, ther- of therapists who uh, are are open to working this way. That that you can go to the Get a website and find and before you press pause on this podcast and go running <laughs> off. <laughs> I need to tell you that as of today, w- w- there's only a handful of therapists on there because we're really just uh, beginning to, to launch, but uh, we will be hopefully ramping up quickly. And so, you know, the hope is that first of all, there will be a place where parents and de- transitioners can go to find therapists who are taking a more open and questioning approach to gender and individuals with gender dysphoria who don't really feel comfortable with the affirmative model. Yes, yes. And it will be a place where therapists, I mean, so many therapists are contacting me these days saying, you know, they're, what's going on with this? Yeah. It, just, it doesn't seem to be like we're doing this the right way. And so I, I want to give we want to provide resources for therapists too, just to, to learn about other modalities and connect with one another. Mm-hmm. And if you are a therapist listening to this, we're going to have this really great um, platform within the website, which allows us to connect with each other, talk with each other, share resources and materials. And we have a lot of um, exciting and hopeful ideas for ways to provide education and information and help therapists who Um, Like, for example, you know, Stella, people contact us all the time. Therapists say, we really love your podcast. We'd love to learn how to do this kind of therapy. Or we're starting to see kids with gender dysphoria, and we want to make sure to give them appropriate ethical care. You know, do you have any resources about that? So this is really why we started GETA, and we, we hope to be a hub for therapists to come and get information about this exploratory way of working with with gender. And we've given it a lot of thought. We've given it like, um, even though we've only started in the kind of recruitment as to, such, if that's the right word, but we've mm-hmm. given a lot of thought to our our baseline about how we want to approach it. And it's very much open to, so long as people are are, are engaged in the therapeutic process and the integrity of a psychological approach, that should be a kind of a, a prerequisite for any therapist who's interested in GETA. That right. it's the integrity of, as you said, Lisa, the psychological approach to psychological distress. Mm-hmm. And that that's good enough, that that has its mm-hmm. place. And yes. there's, there's many other medical models, there's many other models for many other things, and there's also this psychological approach. And we, that's our that's our bag. That's what we're into. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm really proud of the mission statement. We've been working on this mission statement for many, many months. And working and reworking it because we think the wording of the mission statement is important. So just to give some context, individuals who are listed on the directory would have agreed to the mission statement, which is really thorough and it covers a broad range of things like supporting same-sex gender, uh, sexual orientation, supporting the client's autonomy to choose their gender identity, and um, a, a variety of other really important kind of ethical principles. So anybody listed on the directory would have signed the mission statement, and we will also be working to... Um, you know, respond to any information that we get about therapists who are uh, adhering to those ethical principles, or if they're not, they will be removed. So we care very much about trying to um, kind of collect a group of therapists who really have the same values. Right. Of course, of course, we can't sort of uh, police 
practitioners and we can't kind of give you an ironclad guarantee, but this is our, the membership statement is our effort to, to let therapists know that this is the sort of the, the baseline expectations. And it's, it's really pretty much broad after a, a few of these principles and, and, and hopefully therefore create a community of people who are interested in just taking a different approach. Yeah. So we've, we've talked a lot about some of the challenges parents run into when looking for a therapist these days. Um, I don't know if you guys would agree with this, but I think for me and my practice, especially after doing this for several years, I've really um, moved towards encouraging parents to think about their dynamics as a whole, maybe engage um, in like some of the parent coaching resources that exist these days, joining support groups and trying to figure out how to reconnect, rebuild the bond with their child, develop their parental authority so that they can parent with love and structure, which is my favorite phrase. Stella likes it. <laughs> I love it. Um, but I, I tend to think that that's your, your best bet because it's the only thing that you really have any control over, whereas you can't really control what a therapist does behind closed doors. And I, I'm wondering if that general sense feels you know, congruent with you guys. Very much. I mean, the truth is, and you guys both work with adolescents, so you you may really disagree with me, but uh, there are many adolescents who are not even good candidates for therapy. You know, I mean, therapy requires a certain amount ability to self-reflect and to uh, kind of formulate verbally what's going on. And, you know, that's, that's sometimes really hard when you're 13 or 14. Um, nothing magic happens in therapy. It's actually about the relationship. It's a relationship. And you, you can have a good relationship with your kid too. And that, in fact, that's really foundational and important. And, you know, I don't in any way mean to imply that parents who have gender dysphoric kids don't already have good relationships. But what I do think is that, you know, relationships between a parent and a child change at adolescence. And you might've been very, very close when your kid was small. And in, in, in so many cases, parents say, what happened? We were so close. And then gender came along and, and it's like, well, okay. Yeah. But actually what happened is adolescence came along. And there's a renegotiation that happens in the parent-child relationship. And it, you have to abandon the expectations that it will be how it was. I mean, I remember this, like you you hear about adolescents, right? But it still <laughs> took me by surprise when my really incredibly sweet, adorable daughter became a nightmare. I mean, it... <laughs> It was, it was shocking and it was so sad, you know? Mm. Um, so you have to be willing to let that version up. And now of course she's fabulous I and mean, she's great, you know? Um, but, and we have so much fun together, but, but I had to be willing to let that version of the relationship go and then renegotiate a very different kind of relationship, which is hard because adolescents push you away. And so I think a lot of parents, they get pushed away, they get freaked out, the gender thing happens as part of the pushing away, by the way. I mean, yeah. what better way to push your parent away than to say, you know, I'm not, I'm so much not like you that I'm not even female, right? I mean, that's really, um, and, and and then, you know, it's like, well, they they dump their kid off at the therapist's office, like make her how she was before, you know, and that's, that's not going to happen. <laughs> So, so getting close, staying close, um, finding new ways to be close, in fact, finding places where you need to create distance. I mean, I'll just, I, I know I'm probably rambling on here, but I'll, I'll just share one story that I recognized when my daughter was in this stage, kind of early adolescence. Well, first of all, I, I recognized that I was enmeshed with her. And then I decided that being enmeshed with your teen daughter is totally normal and we all do it. Um, and I and I knew that I was enmeshed with her because I tended to kind of share too much of my own emotional process with her. And I'm not talking about I was really divulging very personal stuff. But she sort of always knew how I was feeling about everything because I would just sort of vent a little bit here and there. And I realized she doesn't really want that. Uh, and and um, th and and so I, I sort of trained myself to stop that 
And and there's this great uh, parenting injunction I really appreciate, which is WAIT, which stands for Why Am I, I love Talking? <laughs> you said it so many times, and I still don't remember it, Lisa. Why can't I my head? <laughs> okay, why am I talking? Yes. Because I would get anxious. This is really normal, right? I would get anxious about something, about God knows what, and then I would talk right? So let's say that my daughter wasn't practicing her instrument and this was making me anxious. <laughs> and I'd be, and we'd be in the car together. I'd be like, you know, practicing is really important because that's how, you know, and on it, it's like, shut up, Lisa, <laughs> just shut up. Like you telling her that practicing her instrument is going to, is helpful. It's like, that's not going to work. Like, just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lisa, I've heard you tell this fairy tale and I can't remember it now, but it's basically about holding a loved one while they transform. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and maybe yeah, we can really. wrap up with this because yeah, okay. this is such a perfect story for parents who have an adolescent child. The name of the story is Tam Lin. And in the story, uh, a, a, a woman and her, a woman's engaged to her, her fiance. And uh, he gets uh, taken by the fairies. So she loses him and she is desperate to get him back. And she seech, searches out counsel and a wise woman tells her that what she needs to do is wait until All Hallows' Eve when the fairy trip is going to be riding by. She needs to you know, kind of be in hiding along the side of the track and then pull him from his horse. And then she has to hold on to him tight and he's going to do all kinds of things, but you just have to hold on to him and don't let go no matter what. So she does this. She pulls him off the horse successfully and he turns into a tiger. And then he turns into a roaring fire. And then he turns into writhing serpents. And then he turns into a dragon and she doesn't let go. And then at the end, he transforms back into her beloved and is free from the spell of the fairies. So, so it is this sense of having to just be the container for all of the, am I allowed to say a uh, four letter word on your podcast? All of the shit your kid is going to throw at you. And, and, and really it's this, this idea of kind of containment and holding and you are the steady presence. And I know it's hard <laughs> I always say this, but I don't, I have never managed to do it, but you know, not to be too reactive. Words of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. This was oh, great was to have amazing. you on. C can we have you back on some other time for another I chat? I'd love to, love All to. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is sponsored by Rhyme and Genspect. And listener support means a lot to us. The best way to help is to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Follow us on social media. And if you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts of the show, special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 